Watch Moths to a Flame. It's a series of four, five, actually five months worth of events where we celebrate moths and energy and art and energy's work, um, looking for positive ways of working towards a better future, especially in the face of climate change. So I'm a director of Art and Energy, and so is Chloe, and so is Jenny. And we came up with this Moths to a Flame idea, but before we get into that, I'd like to introduce you to very quickly to our presenters. There's, there's going to be, apart from Chloe and me and Jenny, there's going to be John Walters, who's in Dartmoor. I don't know whether he, you can see him <laughs> to wave, wave at us. There he is. Thank you. Hi, John. And um, there is also Simon, who's in Exeter. There he hey. is. Good evening. Yeah, in Exeter in his garden, and it looks like it's, well, it is still sunny. And then um, Amy down in Abbots Kurzweil in in Tor Bay. Hi, hi, Amy. Hello, hi, everyone. And then we also have Dave, who's established himself in the woods near oh, where he yeah. lives with his mosque, and he'll come in later. So, um, our presenters there now. We wouldn't be able to do any of this without a bit of funding from the Arts Council and National Lottery that. They, they found a fund to support artists that had had a lot of their work disappear because of the virus and COVID-19. So thanks to them. But also we uh, would like to say thank you to Plymouth Energy Community who are partners in this project and who we've been working with for a couple of years now on and off. And um, I think I'm going to hand over to Claire, Claire Mains, who, who works for Plymouth Energy Community, just to say a little bit about what they do. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, I am a project manager with Plymouth Energy Community and uh, we're a charity and our aim is to create a fairer, affordable and zero carbon uh, energy system, which we don't have at the moment. And we've been working with Art and Energy for, for quite some time now. I have to say never did we imagine that we'd be doing such lovely things as we're doing tonight? We've done so much together from making solar panel artworks that you can plug your phone into to charge it, to finding out about 3D printing and, and looking at new renewable materials that uh, we can use creatively. And the reason that we do that is because energy is quite a, it's a tricky conversation and a lot of people feel excluded from it. So um, we're, we're very thankful to be here and we're super excited about the stuff we're doing. Um, and if you enjoy tonight, I would really encourage you to, to book in for the other few sessions because they're all different. Um, so thanks for coming and I'll hand you back over. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just give a little presentation about Art and Energy and about the Moths to a Flame project. And then we shall hand over to our presenters and to their sites and we'll talk about how they might be catching moths, what they might have seen, why they might be interested in moths and it might lead to some conversations about all that's connected to that energy wise. So I've got a little presentation that Jenny is going to start uh, and first of all it starts mm. with a picture of me, Jenny and mm. Chloe and we, we are all part of a collective which is growing which is within Art and Energy CIC and we're standing there big grins on our faces because we're in underneath that massive wind turbine and we've been working with a whole load of children um, looking at wind energy and looking at the landscape they live in. Next slide has a uh, image of that. So as 
as Claire says, we, we do a, a whole range of different types of art as a collective. All of it is about energy, about climate change, about the whole um, issue of how the planet, the ecosystem and all the energy systems work together. And we do a whole range of types of art as well. So that was something we produced with children. This here was the very first piece of solar art that Chloe made. And it's um, made out of solar cells and which have been cut and carefully wired up. And it's, it's really evident that you don't need to have square dark blue or black solar panels you can actually have something much more decorative and meaningful this one's called dawn breaks by the way and what's more these pieces of art actually charge mobile phones and devices so the next slide has chloe plugging her phone in one of the another piece of art that she's made And then we move on to uh, how, how we've been researching this artwork. And here's the reverse side of that dawn breaks. And you can see the wires and you can see how it's all connected. But we've been working in the labs of the Environmental Sustainability Institute. And they have been helping us find out the best ways of making these works, but also they do an awful lot of research about solar cells. And I'm going to get on to moths now, you'll be pleased to know, because what they've been researching is that um, moths have very interesting eyes. They have uh, prism-like cells within their eyes and ripply surfaces to their eyes, which enables them to see even though it may be wet or and, and also, obviously, in the dark, they're, they're so light sensitive that they pick up all those moon, moon and artificial light waves. So this piece of art here, made with the, the people working at the Environmental Sustainability Institute, uh, they have um, each created a moth, which is then finding its way to the central point, the moon. And this is a shield as well, uh, a shield of resilience to climate change. So you can hold this up to the sun, protect yourself, charge your device, charge a light at night. But it's, it's got us interested in thinking about moths, which then set on the journey to moths to a flame. And the next slide about moths to a flame is is perhaps coming back to the, the real moths themselves. They're, they're, we're inspired by them because they got this complex relationship to light. They are attracted to a source of light which causes them harm. So at night time, those that fly at night get sucked in by the light and can actually um, die from that. They're lured also to that area and can, can be caught by predators who hang about the lights to catch them. And, and they're such beautiful, interesting creatures. This is an elephant hawk moth, which many of you probably know, but there it is in among the plants, uh, living its life, interacting with the smallest aspects of our, the world around us that we often ignore. They need all those plants to, to survive. We need them. It, we're all dependent on each other. And of course, all of it comes from the sun's energy. The next slide is one which shows some of the work we're beginning to do ourselves. So when we first set up Moths to a Flame, we decided that we'd create thousands and thousands of, of paper and cardboard moths which people then decorated with black pen and ultraviolet light and the next slide shows how they then come to life lit by backlight 
at night. And all of these moths were then going to form installations for exhibitions. And this was our very first time that we did that. Uh, it was in Plymouth for the Plymouth Illuminate Festival, where we were overwhelmed by the number of people that were interested and wanted to have a go. And in fact, in the forefront there, you will see our very first mock-up of a moth trap, which has a solar panel on the top of it of moths. And it will be charging a battery and a light underneath it so that you can have a, an independent of, of the plug way of uh, seeing what moths are flying at night. A big collection of moths is called a whisper. And we love this fact and we've been using this and we actually, along with having an installation, we have been asking people to uh, leave their whispers as well, whispers of hope for a better future on the planet, um, whispers of demand, things to be done. And the idea is that that sound and this installation come together at some point in the future, which I'll tell you more about. Originally, it was all going up this November after lots of workshops with children and with community groups, with PEC, the Plymouth Energy Community. It was all going up to Glasgow for the very first UK-based climate change conference called COP26. And we thought it was one way of the Southwest taking its messages up to speak to the world leaders. And unfortunately, the, that got cancelled, as we know, but fortunately, it's going to be on next year, same time. And so we will be able to take an even bigger and better um, project up there. We're going to be hosting it, hopefully, we're going to be hosting it in the Botanical Gardens in Glasgow. This year we managed to get this space for the work. We're hoping it'll involve solar artworks, flying moths, sound, a whole, whole host of different things, film. And so luckily, this is what we're aiming for next year now to take stuff up there. The following slide shows what we're doing in addition to that making of the of the whisper, the collection of, of moths. Because we have this little bit of additional money, we're now going to be able to afford to publish this book by Miranda Barlow, who's one of our collective. She's written a book called um, The Moth's Whisper and it's about a little moth called Marnie who comes out of her chrysalis and then discovers a world full of humans lighting up the night, confusing where she should go because she's actually seeking the moon. And at the end of it there's a call to action asking the children who have read it to um, complete her a picture, make it come alive with their phone and, and send their messages up to the people in power and the world's leaders. So the book is one thing that's going to be part of Moths to a Flame. The next thing I think is the next slide is this is a whole load of people making things. So that slide showed people making active, well, the sort of things that we'll produce with activity packs. And we'll be producing at least 500 activity packs, which will be given out free to people in Plymouth. But we'll be making a thousand or so more to um, give out to people and community groups so that they can get involved in moths, making moths, understanding moths, thinking about energy, and all of that um, they'll be able to do at home. So activity packs. And then 
we have produced this colouring sheet, which is the next slide here, which is going to be an augmented reality um, image. In other words, it'll be like a colouring sheet that people colour in. Um, it's, it's the sort of outline of an emperor moth, so it's a, a moth that comes to Devon, if you like, and, um, and then on your phone you'll be able to bring it to life, you'll be able to record yourself with it, take a selfie, and all of that is going to be brought together to be more of a digital projection for the future. And I, I can have a little competition here because you've, you've been getting used to using the chat. Uh, how many sources of energy can you see in this picture? Just have a look at it and see whether you can see a few. Just, there aren't going to be any prizes, but I just um, thought we could get see whether anybody has any ideas. We'll, we'll move on and I'll have a little look later. The next slide has um, the next image has some real moths and part of this project as you know is these moth moths nights and people from all over the place have been sending us photographs of moths that they find in their garden or in their house in their shed so there's four species here i don't know whether are any of our presenters off mute, Jenny. Does, so, John, are you there? Yes, I'm here now. Hello, John. Hi. Um, what can you say about the the wonderful white plume moth on the? That's on the a yeah, it's a white plume moth. It feeds the caterpillar feeds on pine wheat growing in gardens. Uh, so it's it's a beautiful little moth. It's only a few centimeters a couple of centimetres across the wings there. Um, but it's absolutely stunning thing. It's a plume moth, because if you can see, it's got, um, instead of normal wings, it's actually got, its wings are divided into little plumes. So two for the fore wing and two for the hind wing. And it's a stunning, very delicate little thing with long legs, but a stunning little moth. Lovely. And looks a bit like a fairy. But find like that, yeah. <laughs> therefore leave your weeds in, in your garden, everybody. I've, I left a pile of bindweed yesterday. I thought of this plume moth. Yeah, good. So um, the, the one on the right is a clear wing. Amy, Amy do you know anything about that one? Um, and I think that's, is it current clear wing, that one, John? Um, John, you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Give us more info on that. I'll be, I'll be winging it at the moment. <laughs> oh, I can. If you like. I mean, they feed on the caterpillars. Actually, feed in the stems of currants, sort of red currants and black currants, for about a year, and then the moths just emerge about this time of year. I've seen a few people have seen them this week. Usually, when it's hot, so when you get a little heat wave, they all appear um, and they buzz around and they just look like tiny wasps. So, uh, unless you really know what you're looking for, you might think it is a little wasp buzzing around. It lands on a leaf, and you can see it's got those long antennae and it is actually covered in scales, so it's a moth. The current clearing moth. There's quite a few different ones in Britain. Yeah, thanks. And then, and then we've got this uh, little brown, timid-looking moth down there with its wings folded over neatly. Uh, Jenny, you found that one. And uh, has anybody got anything to say about that one? Oh, Simon, are you out there? Simon can say. You can do that one. <laughs> do one each but yeah can you hear me now yes we can yeah i think that's uh what's in a group called the noctuids um uh one of the most common ones at the moment is um something called large yellow underwing which most people will have around lights around their garden if you've got a little bit of green in the back garden um yeah so so very common and they uh eat the stems of um, the soft stems of plants basically the larvae do great thank you and then the last one is a magpie somebody said to me looks 
looks the right colours for a magpie. Yeah, it's a small, a small right. magpie. Yeah, it's lovely. It's on, it's on, um, they found it in a shed, I think. Yeah, it feeds on the caterpillars, feeds on nettles. Oh. There is a big magpie moth. I think Amy may have had one, or Barry uh, caught one last week, which is similar pattern, but this one's much smaller and it's caterpillars feed in a, a rolled up nettle leaf. So leaf patches of nettles as well as bindweed. The garden's yeah. been covered in stuff like this, but it's good for these moths. That yeah. one was actually found in a, an artist friend's studio, in, which is a, a shed and um, has inspired her. I think there'll be some, some mothy artwork coming out. Great, yeah, they're lovely little moths, they're beautiful yeah. things. Yeah, thank you very much, presenters. That's, that's brilliant, moth, moth, mothers, as we call each other at the moment. And my final slide is, uh, is one to just say that we're hoping that we're going to collect all these whispers, everybody's whispers of hope and everybody's images, but we want to work together as a big community to create the, the biggest installation and impact that we can have at COP26 next year so that our whisper becomes a roar. And that's the end of that's the end of the introductory bit that shows you a little bit more about the sort of work that Art and Energy, the Art and Energy Collective make and a little bit more about the background of Moths to a Flame and these Watch Moth sessions. And now we're going to be going over to our first person on site with his moth trap, and that is Simon. Hello, Simon. Hi, everybody. Can Hello. you? Yeah, we can hear you. I am so excited. Look, I bought a new t shirt. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> it's a I... nice insecty t shirt because. There is one thing that I have forgotten to say that this first one is today because of National Insect Week. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, a little bit of competition uh, on the chat box. What's yeah. the moth? Name that moth. Oh, I don't know. It looks quite waspy to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you a. Uh, so, hello, everybody. I'm Simon Bates. I'm very much an amateur in the business of understanding moths. I've been doing it for about 14, 15 years. Um, I got really into it initially, a big, big lull. And then with COVID, um, I've been furloughed and it's given me an opportunity to unfurl the moth trap. Um, so what I'm going to do very briefly is I'm going to show you my moth trap that I'll be running tonight in my garden here in Exeter um, and talk a little bit about the light. Uh, and then maybe if there's time after the other presenters, um, talk a little bit about some of the plants I've got in my garden, which are good for moths. Uh, so operating the phone. There we go. So let just uh, just give you a little bit of mini tallest back back door there um some nice verbenas um there's the trap there's a nice hazel tree that my wife has uh, planted there so you know it's quite a small suburban garden and this is my moth trap here so this is one that i made myself um it's quite simple it's basically four wooden walls um, uh, and there's a fluorescent tube Hi. Hi. and um, this is a it's, it's the sort of light that you find in a very in a in a kitchen it's basically a fluorescent bulb it's 15 watt so it's low energy um, and there's a number of advantages to using this sort of light when you're starting out. Um, so, number one, because it uses low energy, it doesn't, uh, you can run it off a car battery, and that's really good when you get, uh, when you want to go mobile into the country. 
um, because it's low voltage, it doesn't create a lot of light, so it doesn't disturb your neighbours. Um, it doesn't run very hot, so um, if we get rain tonight, which is forecast, then uh, it shouldn't be an issue for this bulb. It shouldn't crack the bulb. You can put covers on them, of course. And then maybe most importantly, when you're starting out, um, it doesn't draw in loads of moths. So you're not going to be overwhelmed with hundreds and hundreds of moths. Um, so when you're starting out identifying, you only get, say, I'll probably get about 30 or 40 moths in here, but I'll get a nice variety of species. So you still get the species. Um, yeah, so um, I can, I can sh I'll just switch it on now, there, and you can see the fluorescent tube starting to glow. Um, what else is there? So there's P Perspex baffles, and basically what the, the moths do, they're attracted to the light, and they fall down here into this gap, and then they try and fly back up towards the light, uh, and they can't escape because of the uh, Perspex. And what they tend to try and do then is get behind the, the egg cartons and they just sort of rest up until I come along in the morning and, and can identify them. That sounds uh, very, very good, Simon. Has anybody got any questions out there for Simon? Otherwise, we'll move on to, we'll move on, thank you, to Chloe and have a look at what you're doing. Sorry, I uh, just seem to have lost her. It's all right, it's all live. Uh, Hello, Chloe, are you out there? Otherwise. Oh. I think we might need to move on. Oh, okay. there she is. I found you, Chloe. Um, unmute audio. Spotlight video. Hello. But hey, Hi. sorry. Hi. Hello. Hello, um, Chloe. So we are here in Heavertree Park. Um, we this is Felix and this is Hector and we are experimenting with two different ways of trapping moths <laughs> winning um, this evening. Uh, the first, um, we can show you a little video that we made earlier in our house. So this is the first of the lo-fi ways that we're trying to catch moths. Basically, we've set up a moth trap in our bathroom. Um, Hello. I'm Hector, and this is my brother, Felix. And um, so, we're making a moth trap. So first we're going to put the sign up. Yep. And then I'm going to open the window. And then I'm going to turn on the light. So I don't know whether anyone else has had this, but the only time that we've ever really oh, seen moths is um, been when we uh, left a window open and a light on at night um, and, and the reason why we're closing the door is because so you can't really hear properly here um, we we're keeping the door closed to the rest of the house so that don't get moths in the rest of the house but also so our cats don't escape bye, bye. and we'll see you in so yes, we will see you in the morning with letting you know what happened. Last time we tried this, and we tried this a couple of weeks ago, we did catch a moth. Hector, you found it, didn't you? It had flown into the rest of, into another part of our house, and it was a uh, scalloped oak. Um, so we're hoping that we're going to find something else like that. Hector would really like to find, what was it that you were looking for? A, tiger moth. a garden tiger moth. Yeah, that's right. So the other thing that we're doing in our kind of lo-fi, let's start out looking at moths, has been to set up a white sheet just behind us. I don't know whether you can see, we've strung up a white sheet in the park um, with some clothes pegs. And we're sitting out here with a torch. This is a, and you know, because we're kind of art and energy types, 
it's a solar powered torch so we're hoping that we're going to find some moths a little bit later on we've found ourselves a shrubbery and we're more or less just sitting in it <laughs> so um yeah that's where we are and hopefully that we're going to find something in one of our two traps we yeah. need a second shrubbery you need us more shrubs for more <laughs> moths Shrubs are indeed very good for moths. You will find that. Great. Thank you very much, Chloe. I'm going to do my thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you, Simon, as well, for your garden. And we look forward to coming back to you. Um, now we've got a little art and energy interlude because those solar lights using solar cells just remind us that we can use solar cells. We love making collaborative artworks that get everybody thinking about energy differently. So this is just a little video, one minute long, and then we'll carry on with the moths. Thanks. So our solar door made with ex staff and students from Exeter University and uh, now we're going to wing over, fly over or something to who we're going to see first. I think it's to Amy. Can we say hello to Amy? How are you doing Amy? Hello, hello everyone. Hi, my name's Amy um, and uh, welcome to my garden in Sunny Abbott's Kurzweil. Um, I thank you for inviting me along as well, Naomi and crew. Um, so yes, I've, the, here's my moth trap. Um, it's very similar to Simon's. Um, I didn't make it though. I had a, my dear father-in-law who just retired and had a handy sort of woodshed, didn't look busy enough. So I um, found the instructions online and, and asked him very nicely if he'd mind making, making it for me. And, and it's, yeah, it's super, it's, it has a different, sort of uh, light on here when I got online it, it's the UV that's quite important on light bulbs if you're choosing a light bulb but it has the same sort of perspex sides and um, sort of scattering of egg boxes there in it all and um, yeah I don't catch as many as um, as some people do um, uh, but it still certainly gives a good variety of species and um, I'm very fortunate here in Abbots Kurzweil because I actually there are a couple of moth experts in the village, so I've managed to learn quite quickly <laughs> a few things. And with any luck, those of you who tune in tomorrow morning will get to meet Barry Henwood, who will be here helping me ID some moths. And um, Barry is the Devon, or well, the county moth recorder for Devon, and hugely knowledgeable. So um, hopefully he'll also bring his moth trap, which is a, a different sort, um, and it's a moth trap on steroids. I mean, he just, it's full of colour and it's absolutely loaded with moths. So, um, so tune in tomorrow for that. Um, so I've only been doing it for a couple of years. Um, I always had an interest in plants, in the out outdoors, and I think it kind of, it, it just sort of found me really, because um, I knew, you know, a little bit about butterflies, a little bit about birds, a little bit about wildflowers. And it felt like there was another, an, a bit missing. And, um, you know, if you 
start looking, you just find evidence of moss anywhere. And it, they're not just a sort of brown thing that flaps about in the kitchen. When you actually slow down and, and look at them and look at the colours and look at the different shapes and the different sizes and the names as well, which is just so romantic and extraordinary, um, it's hard not to get sucked in really. And if, if I'm going to try and show you just a couple of things, if, if there's time to do this, I'm going to um, try and put you on my um, phone. So I'll mute that. Right. That down. So, moths. Um, this, speaking of things that were just sort of flying around the kitchen, this is a little one I found today. And I don't know if it's how much of a good look you can get at it. But, you know, if you, if you weren't really looking, you'd just think, well, it's a sort of little brown job. But when you zoom in and look at the patterns of it, it's just, just extraordinary. I've got a picture here. That particular moth is called the yellow shell, which um, is illustrated there. But the illustration doesn't really do it any justice. And the reason I was just showing you that is that sort of that's the start of it. But if you have someone like Barry Henwood, who's my kind of caterpillar dealer in the village, then you might also get, find yourself with some caterpillars. And which obviously you can rear and then turn, turn into moths as well. I've got here some buff ermines, which are very, very furry little caterpillars squiggling around in there. And so you have to learn, you naturally learn what, a little bit about that because you find that, well, what do they need to eat? Here's a picture of a buff ermine in the book, just there. And, and then I thought, right, okay, well, honeysuckle, I've got honeysuckle in the garden, so I better go and have a look at the honeysuckle and um, make sure the moths get fed. And then lo and behold, on the underside of a honeysuckle leaf, oh. I don't know if you, that's in the uh, oh. view there, are buff ermine moth eggs. So I kind of went backwards to get there <laughs> with it all but um you you know when you start understanding a little bit about the life cycle like that it's just i mean for me how can you not be drawn into it it's uh, there's a little journey for you anyway i'm gonna That's leave amazing. my phone and then just come back and turn you up That's i don't know if that worked if anyone could hear me or not but yeah we did That's yeah, that <laughs> 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 Um, thank you. So, yeah, you, you, you gave us a bit of information, not only about how, how you started getting interested because you were looking at the whole, the whole ecosystem and insects, moths are part of that, but I love that life cycle of the performance. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. And if people have questions, keep them keep them coming into chat and you'll you'll see your um you'll see some answers that pop up or we'll see whether we can um ask the presenters the questions later on lovely they're saying you're amazing amy great thanks now we we go over to john and see how he's doing hello there hi there everyone hello john hi have have you seen any moths today, John? Oh yeah, I've got one on me now, actually. Um, if you can see just there, uh, I'll hold it up to the screen. I've just been hatching these out for some people that want to film them. It's a uh, small elephant hawk moth, this one. Uh, you can see it there in the light, wow. lovely little moth. Uh, yeah, I've seen lots of moths this week. Uh, I've been out, um, out every day, all day, in the sunshine, looking at not just moths, but everything, really. So. I've been to Dorset, I've been on Dartmoor today actually, uh, looking around the site, saw a hummingbird hawk moth flying around. Uh, lots of silver Y moths, which have flown in from the continent, they're moths which you know, fly out from Europe. And with the southerly winds and thunderstorms we had last night, that sort of brought up a whole load of moths. So yeah, it's a good time to be out and about doing that. Yeah. Uh, I've been into moths for years, very over 40 years. I started when I was about five, rearing some small tortoiseshell butterfly caterpillars. Um, and then once I got to school and I was about 11 or 12, my dad made me a moth trap, a mercury vapour moth trap. Uh, my granddad was, used to be a manager of a light bulb factory, which was wow. handed by dad as an electronics whiz. So between them, 
uh, they put together a moth trap for me, which lasted for many years. I ran it for years and years, about 15 years uh, when I was sort of a teenager uh, until I left to go to college. I ran it pretty well every night of the year and caught all sorts of moths. That was on Haley Island in Hampshire, uh, where I grew up. And I was right near the coast and near some nice habitats some sand dunes and coastal uh, habitats there really close by. So I caught lots and lots of moths. So that's what really got me into it. I'm into all sorts of natural history though. So I've always been fascinated by birds and insects and everything really. So I do everything, but uh, I did do a, moths were my first love really, you know, when I was a child, really getting into moths and particularly rearing the caterpillars. I see yeah. angry with uh, uh, ermine moth caterpillars. It's really great fun to do rear caterpillars and let, let the moths go. I've got some, um, similar to the uh, caterpillars Amy had, I've got some muslin moth uh, caterpillars at the moment. And I think Amy, you may have seen on Twitter, I posted a little tweet to them the other day. Uh, they're the fastest caterpillars in the world, I think. Um, if you have a look on my uh, Twitter feed um, for one day in the week, um, uh, you'll see a little video of the, um, of the muslin moth caterpillars and they are so fast, it's not speeded up in film. They literally whiz around at high speed. Uh, I'm not sure why they do that. Uh, maybe it's to escape from predators because they certainly seem, I took some out in the garden, they sit on some grass on a bit of bare ground and then if you come along, they suddenly run off at vast speed into the vegetation to hide. So they're great fun things to rear. I've got about 60 and they were all from one female moth I found when I was doing some work down in the South Hounds. Uh, I, caught, I brought the moth back and uh, put her in a pot, she laid some eggs. Uh, the caterpillars feed on dandelions and they're all just about pupating now, a few full grown. So, and I'm always doing that, finding caterpillars, um, breeding moths and all sorts of things. My house is a bit of a menagerie and our fridge is uh, a special one. It's, uh, my wife's given me a a special section in the fridge for moths and bugs. Um, so <laughs> be careful if you're looking in there uh, yeah. for something to eat maybe. Um, you might pull out a box and think that's tasty and it's got a big hawk moth in or a load of pupae of uh, some, something else. So yeah, it's all good fun. That sounds it. Sounds brilliant. Thank you. Now, um, last week we had a, a bit of a dry run and I, I came across a caterpillar on a footpath that day. Do you remember? It, oh, was yeah. a, it was a very hairy fat stripy sort of caterpillar that that i thought might be dead but it turned out it wasn't and you said put it in a put it in a terracotta pot so i i got a little terracotta pot and i wrapped it in wrapped it in bramble leaves and things like that and it and it just almost immediately turned itself into a pupa and a cocoon yeah. so yeah. How, how long does it take? Well, Does each moth take that. a different length of time to become well, a... It depends on the moth. Those ones fly in July, so it'll be sometime in a couple of weeks' time. So the best thing to do is to put it in a, in a flower pot with some netting over the top, uh, yeah. maybe with a little bit of soil in the bottom or something that you can spray just lightly just to keep it damp. Okay. Uh, and then just put it somewhere where you're going to notice it and uh, during the day and then you'll see the moth sitting on there one day. If it's, uh, if it's a female moth, if you look them up in the books, um, or just send me a picture of it. And the best thing to do is just to stick it out in the garden on a sunny afternoon or when it hatches. And then the males are day flying. They're attracted by the pheromone produced by the female. And uh, you can stick it out somewhere. You may have never seen a male Okega moth, but if you stick the female out in your garden, you'll suddenly become the most popular place ever. For them. And uh, get inundated with them. Within a few minutes, there'll some turn up and one of them will mate with the female and then you can let them off go and it will go off and lay her eggs somewhere. Thank you, yeah, I will do that. I'll put netting on top. I just found kitchen paper, but yeah, netting. No, that's fine, anything like that. But yeah, put some, put some netting over it otherwise, and then the moth can climb up and then sit on the netting because it needs to dry its wings. That's why it needs to be slightly damp if you've got the pupae in, in there. And make sure you, you, just not really wet, but just spray it so it's humid in there. So when the moth first emerges, its wings are tiny little stumps and it pumps them with fluid, which is very quick drying. So this doesn't take more than sort of 10, 15 minutes to actually pump all the fluid into the wings. Then it holds, it, holds the wings out flat across its back um, and then it hardens, the fluid hardens inside. And then once they're hard, it can close the wings to its normal resting position. And then it's after an hour or so, it's ready to fly. Great. I'll I'll look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks, Don. So, in the morning, 
we're going to see a film that John's going to talk over of all the moths that he found a couple of days ago uh, near him because at the moment the well the signal's not brilliant where where you live is it John so well where I run the moth trap yeah there's not really a signal there so it's the and it's easier for me to uh, go out I got up early a couple of days ago I was up about five o'clock and uh, friends up the road own a big estate so I, I able to run the moth trap there and there's loads of moths there it's, it's a, they run the places a nature reserve so you're always going to find good moths and they stick the light on I just go and check it in the morning and I'll show you some of the amazing moths that we found on the short film tomorrow yeah great thank you and and then we've got a, an additional presenter who um, has come to the join our moth trapping parties called Dave. Dave Barker. Are you are you there and unmuted? <laughs> I am. He's he's in the middle. Well you explain where you are, Dave, and who you are and Okay, so um Okay, so yeah, so quickly, um as time is short now, um I'm sort of um I'm based on my partner's family farm. We've got forty five acres. We're around about twelve miles east of Plymouth and about three miles south from Dartmoor and um, I'm completely new to moths even though I'm a, I'm, I'm a professional ecologist I mainly specialize in bats and habitat management uh, and we're running a farm here uh, for wildlife and for food production and uh, the main reason we're doing the moth trapping here now well we started really is to actually um, look at find out what species we have but also um, by understanding the species we have we can hopefully understand the health of the land and actually from that point onward that be our baseline and then we can keep monitoring each year and hopefully we can see the species increase and the abundance increase as well and so yes yeah, so at the moment I'm in one of our lower meadows we just got a little the tree line at the bottom there is a brook um, and another interesting thing about where we are uh, this is very a very old school Devon traditional farm, but the other side of the valley is an industrial um, dairy unit that is actually it's pretty much like a factory floor really. So it's a good sort of teaching sort of landscape to have the two different types of management going on. Um, so as you can probably see, I'll just pick the camera up. Oh! So as you can see, it's a quite a, all our farm is little small little traditional fields, um, all surrounded by big oak. Um, trees and scrub willow and ash um, and then where I've got the moth trap set up is this old hedge bank that's completely overgrown now um, and I'll just turn the camera around and take you in to see where the moth trap is. Oh yeah you've got it. So we've only been here. <laughs> yeah, yeah well I've, 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 I've rigged up a, um, a tarpaulin because Apparently it's supposed to be heavy rain from now until five o'clock. So I didn't know if the moth trap's going to handle it or not. So this is a t different moth trap again from the one that you've seen from everybody else. This is called a heath trap. This completely collapses down and goes in my backpack. So, and it runs off a small little battery uh, that lasts about eight hours. So I can take this anywhere I want to go. If I'm up on Dartmoor, if I'm wild camping up there for the night, I can take it with me. Um, I can work around the country. I can always set it up on a, on a nature reserve or where I'm working and do some recording there for the local record centers. So that's the hope for the future. Um, so yeah, that's, that's quickly where I'm at. So hopefully we get to see some moths tomorrow from here. And, um, and uh, go, go from there really. Well, we look forward to seeing you in the morning, Dave. Yeah, hopefully it's not going to rain too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you're not going to camp out there, though. I was thinking of it. I was thinking of putting a, putting a, putting a hammock up, but I thought, no, nice cozy bed for the night. I've been, I've been up the last three nights doing bat work, so um, I, I need a night in the, uh, in the bed tonight. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be good. And um, hoping that we're all going to have a good night's sleep. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So we have, we've been round to all our presenters, all our moth experts, and looked at all the different ways we're going to be um, finding moths. We've learned some moth life cycles and looked and found out about how to look after our, our um, caterpillar pupae. 
uh, we've we've been introduced to art and energy and to the way we might look at the world through a energy systems lens through thinking about the way that moths are part of the bigger ecosystem which all operates on the planet with the energy from the sun so it's all everything is interconnected and i think i think then everybody it's been brilliant having so many of you with us and we are looking forward to seeing you at eight o'clock in the morning to find out what's been discovered in our, our different environments and habitats which is fantastic has any of my team got anything else to add oh i've thought of one thing which is that little competition i know it wasn't a very big one but that picture i noticed somebody said five different sources i th i think there's six but another person a friend called joe found 15 uh, earlier on in the week so i think perhaps we're all right but that picture has lots of different examples of energy in it i'm just pulling it back up again yeah Ooh. yeah so bernice had five yeah um, it depends i think by the definitions yeah um, we've certainly got the moon the stars um, and then if we're thinking about energy as a um as a subject matter we've got our, our wind turbine we've got a little bit of street light just poking out oh my mouse went come over the street light just poking out down the bottom here and we've got the aeroplane and i guess you could possibly include the moth in there as well in terms of energy and, and life energy yeah i was because watch moths that's what mm. we are that's what we're doing so um th thank you all for coming again and we will see you in the morning and i hope you all sleep well and dream of beautiful moths just to finish with we we're going to give you a little sneak peek of um a film that john recorded to us for us last week um of the moths that he found and was able to, to present for us on the saturday morning um we're only going to play you a, a minute or so of this but just to give you a, a bit of a lure back in the morning um here we go So it's the, thank you, it's the same code, it's the same everything to get into the um, session tomorrow morning. And if you want to overnight or look, at, look up any of the stuff that we've been talking to you about, there's our email, I mean our website, and the Plymouth Energy Community has a website and there's more information about Moths to a Flame project. So see you then. Okay, see you. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 In the morning. Bye, Simon. Bye, Amy. Bye, Dave. Bye, John. Bye. See ya. Hi, everybody. You.